Okay, welcome to tonight's lecture. My name's Tom Gelly. I'm part of the Rookie Academy. And I'm going to start, first of all, with a disclaimer, which I think is really important because uh, what I'm sharing tonight is just sort of personal learnings, things that I've discovered through talking with others, doing my own skiing, that sort of stuff. So some things might not make sense to you at this point or you might disagree with it. And I think that's okay, that, that's fine. Uh, I also might not agree with myself in five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time with what I'm saying. But at this point in my skiing career, what I'm gonna share with you has helped me. I hope it helps you. It comes with really good intentions behind it. And I would say the final thing is that the information that you get from this hopefully makes you more uh, interested to, to experiment and play with your skiing and, and play with your equipment uh, because that's what the information helps me do. So why don't my skis behave? So looking at a little bit more how ski equipment uh, works. So just we begin with how does a ski make us turn? Because that's kind of what's happening. We're manipulating the skis with the snow and then that is making us move around the mountain. And so I sort of think of it uh, in, in two main uh, ways, both of which create a steering angle, okay? So where your momentum is going and then where the skis are kind of placed to push you or deflect you around that placement is, could be called a steering angle. So two ways, using the side cut and bending the ski. And the other one, skidding or steering to create a steering angle that is different from where your momentum is to deflect you around the corner. So quite different and really, especially at a mountain like treble cone, you're gonna need to use like both at different times and, and they're gonna mesh and mix together in different percentages, you could say. And so let's have a look at Archie, my son, skiing at Cadrona the other day. There he is. So, and, and what I want you to notice when you watch this is just think about, like just watch the skis and just think about at times you'll see him like twist it and edge it, other times you'll just see him just roll it. And even though there's not a lot of edge angle there is, you know, there's this tipping and sort of slight bending of the ski that's making him go around the corner. And you know, he doesn't know anything about why skis work, he's just feeling what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but you know he's starting to figure out and feel what you know different where different pressure is placed how to sort of move his body and how to like pressure the skis and and work the edge to help him get around the mountain and have fun so he's not using one method only it's like a like a definite mix um, but you can see he's really starting to figure out that the, the skis, when you tip them, they create a, their own steering angle and go around the corner kind of with a lot more speed and uh, like give you these fun forces kind of feelings. So yeah, I think that's interesting to see, you know, four and a half year old and he's, do he's doing pretty well just through playing around and, and just gradually feeling how the equipment works. Okay, so I, I cover this, some people might already, already know it, uh, but just, just to clarify things. So you can see the shape of the ski uh, here, we're all on, on shaped skis. The tip and tail are wider, the, the waist is narrower. Uh, the first thing you need to do with the ski to make uh, bending work is you need, to, you need to tilt it. And notice without any pressure, there's this gap under the middle. Okay, so only the, the tip and the tail are in contact with the surface and we would say that surface is like the snow. So that's the first part. The interesting thing to note is the more you kind of tip it up, the more that gap under the foot 
opens up. Okay, so then the second part, bending the tip ski. So now weight from uh, your body and centripetal force helps bend the ski and makes the ski uh, then fit and kind of stop once it's pressed like that in, into the snow. And it's lucky the skis are sharp and, and the snow is kind of not totally bulletproof. This this will all work. But you could you could hopefully understand that like that ski's tipped over like nearly 90 degrees for demonstration. But if you only tipped it like how much arch is tipping it, it's not going to bend as much as that as that diagram. So the more you tip it, the more the possibility of bending it is. Once it's bent there, it's it's in the shape of a of a curve. Yep. And so your the tip is like always pointed more around the corner than where your momentum is and so that's that steering angle that's constantly pulling, pulling, pulling you around the corner. Uh, it's important to know like how much you can bend a ski so if you skied today and skied on some of that firm snow there's, there's like a limit so once the ski is tipped and it's pressed and it fits the snow it won't bend further. It doesn't bend further. If you want it to turn more you have to use other methods that uh, are not purely carved to help it turn further. So just really important to, to know that um, because sometimes you might feel you bend it more. Often that's happening in softer snow where the, the snow surface gives a little bit under your foot. So for instance in powder snow on a big fat ski, you can really bend a ski a lot more if, the, if it's got a bit of density to it because you know it's going to keep bending, bending, bending. Uh, the tip and tail will, uh, will hold to a certain point. But when it's on firm snow like Marcel Hersher here, there's a limit. And it's kind of like interesting that bird's eye view. That ski doesn't look very bent. Okay, so when, you, when you're bending a ski to turn it, it doesn't look as, as much as some people uh, think. Uh, yeah, so the other, so you, you're, if you're not pure carving, you're distributing pressure on different parts of the ski. Example, more towards the tip will help pull through the arc, but there's always going to be, when you're doing that, some displacement or, or skidding of the tail. And so that gets us into the other method, this steering one, uh, skidding method of creating a steering angle, and what I want to share with you more about today, because that's, the, I think that's the real interesting one. Good, good ski, like I don't think it's very hard to just tip a ski, stand in the middle and bend it. Uh, really, at the end of the day, it it just get, you just have to have more and more balls to go faster and do it, and as long as you have sharp ski, it's easy. But to be able to like change it and feather it in from skidded into pure carved or choose like the right moment, I think that's, that's when you become like more of a master to be able to, to blend it. So, uh, a little bit of backstory. So, for, for steering a ski, I didn't really know this, and uh, as clearly as I kind of understand it now, until I spoke to a guy named Yuri Franco. Uh, would have been in two. Uh, let's see, when did I interview him? 2018. I chat to Yuri Franco. And he's the guy who developed the Elan shape ski. He was, his, he was working for Elan and he was tasked to actually build a ski that didn't skid. That was his first uh, mission. So I'm just going to play, hopefully you can hear a bit from this, but nine minutes in he's, he's talking about this, uh, yeah, his, his, the goal of what like Elan wanted him to do. The situation with uh, the ski industry at that time. <laughs> And the question was, uh, why, uh, how can we make a ski which will not uh, skid? So. Okay, so that's what he was tasked with. How can you make a ski that does not skid? And so then, being he's a, a physicist, he first goes out and goes, well, what makes a ski skid? So he took uh, all sorts of different types of ski, different lengths, children's skis, adult skis, uh, different constructions. And he basically set up like a, a, t a test where he had a slope and then he put the skis like on the slope against, against it at a certain angle, it was all the same angle. And then he had a device which would, would measure how much force was put on to pull it. And he pulled from the middle 
and like saw what amount of load did each ski start skidding from. And what he discovered, when he touched in the center, all the skis skidded or slipped at the same amount of load, whether it was a fist slalom ski or a kid's ski. So he's like, oh, interesting. However, there was a difference in when they skidded or they would skid more easily when this device that was pulling the ski sideways, right, like a skid, was placed off center of the ski, either forward of it or back of that point. As soon as it was, as soon as it was placed forward or back of that point, the more it was, the more the ski skidded and with less effort. Okay, so from there, he uh, says, okay, well, a ski, when it skids, usually as long as the edge is sharp and you know, you're in the right place, balance there, it's more a, uh, a, a torsion, a, a pivoting that is happening. Because if you're you know, dragging a ski, like, like the load's here and you pull here, it's gonna drag like this. But if, if the load is uh, like further forward, and you pull on it, it's going to create uh, a pivot point and it will pull around that, uh, that pivot point. So he's like, okay, the uh, like skiers before shape skis had to move a lot more forward on the ski to get the front of the ski to engage, the back to be less, Therefore, when the load was going through, the ski went into a self-steering movement like this, created a steering angle, and then as long as they were manipulating where their balance was, it would either keep steering or they would move it back and it would stop steering once they got where they wanted to go. Uh, and so then he went on to then, okay, let's how do we make a ski that you don't need to do that on? And then that's why he ended up with, with the shape ski. Um, but for me, I went, oh, that's really cool because I, as, a, as an all-mountain skier and versatile skier, I know it's really important to be able to steer. Um, and this piece of information was really interesting to me. It made sense why people talked about getting forward and, and, and also why uh, when just before then I'd recently switched to skis that were stiffer, torsionally stiffer, and I really liked them. And uh, it made sense as to why because the difference, like if, you, if we're all testing skis and you're out there and there's, you know, five skis, we'd all probably come back with, say, the stiffest ski and say, agree that that one is, is, has the most grip, right? It doesn't slip as much. And then, the, and then the beginner ski that's really soft, even though they're, if they're all perfectly tuned and everything, the beginner ski that's really soft, we'd say that's the, the most skiddy type ski. Yeah. So, the difference is with a stiffer ski that is more torsionally uh, strong, so less resistant to torsion, you've got a bigger sweet spot. So that test that he did where he pulled the ski sideways, you can be more like forward or back and that won't affect the ski skidding out as much. Whereas on a beginner ski, when it's very soft, especially torsionally, if you get a little bit forward, that thing skids very easily. So your sweet spot on a beginner ski is tiny and it's so it makes it easier to turn. Your sweet spot on a, on a World Cup GS ski is really big so you can be more forward, be more back and the ski still holds better and will carve better. And uh, yeah, so anyway, that's a, a really interesting point. And so basically to summarize, when you shift your balance point, front or back of this center point, you, the ski, no matter what edge angle it's at, because remember that test, he pees like lots of edge angle, pull on it. If the, for, if the load is forward or back, it'll skid. Okay, even if your hip's on the snow, you're right over. If you're forward or you're back a bit, it will make the ski want to skid. Cool. So you think, okay, is it just about then uh, trying to stay centered the whole time. Well, no, not necessarily because what you can now do is you can play with your four and a half balance to make the ski skid, go into self-steering, and then just think about balance adjustment to help you like 
turn less or, uh, or, or move forward uh, or whatever to, to help it turn more. So, uh, yeah, it, it, so do we turn the skis or do they turn us? Because if you go to different associations and uh, people around the world, some, some countries and associations emphasize like adding leg steering and an effort to turn the skis. And a lot of those people talk about being centered more of the time. But if you go to a country like Austria, they don't really talk about turning the feet or the legs at all. They talk about up, down, and lots and forward and inward movements, so edging and fore and aft movements. And yet they all show very similar types of skiing. So the result in the end is, is it does like an Austrian looks like they turn with their legs, just like a Canadian <coughs> looks like they turn with their legs. Yet how they're saying they're doing it is kind of different. So I think it's cool if you guys know if you're standing on a pair of skis and you edge it and you move forward and you know now, okay, when I do that, the ski is going to want to go into a self-steering effect. If I allow that, my legs will turn because the ski is turning and I'm just expecting my feet to follow that. And if you're expecting that, then you can chill out and just let the ski turn your <laughs> turn your leg for you. Or you can sort of be a little bit more centered and, and as you add a twisting effect, a lot of the time what you're doing is you're changing where the load is on the ski. You're adding a twisting effect, yes, but you're changing the load so you're making often the tail lighter, the tip engage more, grip, steer around. But I think it's really important if you, if you just understand this part, how the physics of a ski turns and, and what skidding is, and that it's not bad, it's just what happens, you can play with that a whole lot more. Okay? So one's not right, one's not wrong, it's just, uh, I think they're, they're talking about the same thing uh, at the end of the day, just how to do it. Well, yeah. Yep, go for it, yep. Cool. So, your feet now become really, really important because of how rich the, uh, the information you receive from the nerve endings is. So ligaments, the fascia, all this sort of stuff you've got in your body, all these different types of receptors, receptors that tell you about pressure, heat, stretch, uh, itch, pain, all sorts of things, and they're, and they're so sensitive. So like the pressure ones, if you start taking notice of that and you're riding your ski you might notice the subtle difference between when you balance like say that's the ball of my foot like here versus two millimeters forward or two millimeters to the right or left inside or outside as you start doing that and you start paying attention when i press there and feel there how much does the ski skid on the snow today how much does it grip more your feet are going to tell you how to pilot those skis and they're the things that's telling you, not, not the coaches, <laughs> it's not our job. You want to learn to feel yourself, the performance of your turns, and really be able to feel through your feet when the ski is, is skidding, or like skidding like a micro, like one centimeter, or a lot. Your feet will tell you. And so I think some people uh, end up really dead in their feet. They're thinking about their hips or other stuff. and. So my message here is because of how that ski works, listen to your feet. They're going to tell you how to pilot that video. Uh, so before I do that one, just on that, the sensitivity of, of your feet. This graph is from a, uh, some research done by Lou Rosenfeld and uh, some other people. I, I, this, I only know Lou Rosenfeld because I've chatted with him again on one of my podcasts. He's done probably the most, or been involved with the most amount of research on binding placement, and it's the, the effect of binding placement fore and aft, or wherever it is, on the ski to how the ski performs. And so another really interesting person to, that I met and, and talked to. Subject S1 is a World Cup level skier, and each of those different graphs is that's one turn, and it's fore and aft movement. So zero is centered. 
So this person had sensors under their feet that were linked up to a computer system. And so uh, you can see at the start, like the first 20% of the, of the turn, this skier is moving forward, okay? When they reach halfway through the turn, they're, they're moving back more. When they get through to like 80%, they're actually even moving back of center ever so slightly in uh, this example. This dark line is when the bindings have been moved uh, back 14 millimeters of the, the center point. Uh, or centimeters, I can't remember, but, but, but back more. 14 plus is, is in front. So that's a World Cup skier. This person is like a state level, uh, it, was, it, was, it was in Canada, so they're provincial level, so say like British Columbia level ski racer. So still really good, probably would uh, he's probably kick my ass down a race course. But what's interesting, when in this test they move bindings to see how does this person's balance change, can you see the graph looks quite different? Each time it's changed, it doesn't look the same. So what can you get from this? Well, a world-class level athlete, when you change something, they feel it, they move accordingly, and still make it all work. Someone who's trying to get there almost maybe makes like the same pattern of movements, and even though something's adjusted, then they're not adjusting with it and feeling and, and moving the pressure under their feet and then making that ski work. Because remember, what's happened in this test from zero, the person has moved the binding, so then where that person's load goes through the ski is through a different point on the ski. World Cup level person almost looks exactly the same and the pressure shows like the same pattern. The other person, a lot more different. So probably with you guys, uh, it would be even more Right, and, and so what uh, he's discovered from there is like every person has a, a really ideal place on their bindings where they're mounted that it's easier to make the movements to engage the tip, stand in the center, maybe use a bit of tail. And we won't go there today, but that's an interesting thing to try. Uh, it's also one of the big reasons why different brands feel very different. They all, they might use different uh, construction, all that sort of stuff, but from what Lou's looked at, the biggest thing that will change a ski's characteristics is where the binding is mounted. So Rosignol, for example, tend to be a little more forward. Vocal tend to be a little more back, it, like in general. And so ski brands are, are different and you might, depending on your weight, size of foot, skiing style, that's why you hate vocal like Solomon, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But you can change where the binding is. Uh, let's see what I want to show here. <laughs> Any questions so far? Check with, yeah? So, your picture. This one? So, yeah, looks like a negative 14, but both similar kind of shape. Other one no, is just a total different. And I assume the S1 skier the more ideal kind of shape. So then uh, you get, I kind of get the idea of minus 14 is more similar shape than to the rest. So is that kind of ideal position? No. 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 You'd have to. You'd have to look at video and ask the person what they feel. And and you know, if he's a racer, it would be time. So it's just more. Just look at it in terms of patterns. And also the difference between someone who's, like my point is about your feet. Just be sensitive and feel what's going on and adjust. And the more you do that, you can get on different equipment and, it, and it's fine. Most people, they get on, say you're on a new pair of skis, a new pair of boots, you just do the same movements over and over again instead of like feeling, is this movement making the ski skid or is it making it carve? So that's, that's the main message I, uh, you want to get from that one. Anyone, anyone else got? Any other questions? Oh, okay. Uh, let me see if I can find, because we had that video. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Just to clarify the um, sting. 
let's see, hopefully this is, it's loaded, yes. Uh, to clarify that, like, okay. Sometimes you watch skiing and it's played at full speed and you can't tell if the person is pure carving the whole turn or if they're steering part of it. It's like very hard to see, okay? Uh, and I think this catches a lot of people out because they think if you're pure carving a turn, then it's pure carved, like, okay, I'm in pure carve mode. I just edge the ski and try and carve it completely from top to bottom. This, this is like a, a not too difficult black run in Canada, but it, it's a black run. So it's, it's uh, fairly steep in the afternoon. So it's not smooth. It's been skied, skied around. It's kind of a bit bumpy. When I'm initiating the turn here, <coughs> I am playing with my four and a half balance. So I'm actually, and you can kind of see like almost there, the tails are, are more, they're, they're unweighted slightly and I'm trying to balance more towards the tip of the ski. Still edging a lot, so still edging a good amount, but my, my pressure is up along this part of the ski more. When I do that, I don't need to almost even twist the ski because if I edge and get forward, the back of the ski, there it goes, is going to displace and go out a little bit. So, it looks like a carving type turn, but if you looked at the tracks in the snow for this top part here, they would be more like this as opposed to two uh, pure lines. However, once I feel like I've got my steering angle set up, I can switch modes, switch where the pressure is through my foot and through the ski, like right now, and now I'm trying to bend the ski from the tip to the tail by standing right in the middle. Here's another one. Being forward on the ski more, getting the tip to hook up. Still with a lot of edge angle and it's, uh, maybe you can see it here, but like the back, there it goes, washes out a bit more. I get my steering angle. I now switch into pure carving mode uh, to finish the turn around the corner. So I guess my, yeah? Just to give people context, um, you're trying to feel the balance between your feet forward and aft. Yeah. Which is in your feet, but part of it might be in your ear. Yeah. How much physical difference is there between a forward and aft in your mind, or what do you think it's been yep. about? What does that change? How small is it? Uh, that's a really good question. And we'll I was going to mention it later, but we'll get to it now. It's pretty small. I'll, and the easiest way is if I, if I I'll, I'll stand on this table. If I just pretend I'm like there doing that run, I'll show you from this angle. I would, I would say I go to about there. There's, there's, there's where I stand to make the tip and tail engaged. There's, there's forward. I don't really go any more than that. And then to make, if I want to go a little more tail pressure, it's that. There's centered, that's tail pressure. That's tip. Does it look pretty small? Yeah, so it's, it's not much. Have a, I mean, you look at the size of your foot, it's pretty, pretty small. Once you get beyond that point, you're just, like you're kind of falling forward and you're going to be, your boot is just then I know people talk about levering on, leveraging on the boot, but you almost need to only just go to the point where you get a little bit of leverage and that's it. Beyond there is like a waste, in my opinion anyway. It's, it's, it's not very big. And then back to that graph, the graphs, the World Cup guy, notice he didn't, he stayed very consistent no matter where that binding was placed. Anyway, uh, maybe this brings up another point if you want to steer a ski, because you're going to need to to ski steeper terrain and make shorter turns and ski off piste, if you want to steer a ski, there are two simple things to do that make it really easy. One, get your skis in the air <laughs> or your feet in the air. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm uh, this is like no joke. Look at. Uh, there. It's hard to see, but my feet are in the air. There's not a lot of pressure. And no one will rotate their upper body when their feet are in the air and you try and turn it. 
But if you stick your feet on the ground and, you try, and then you stand on them and you try and turn them, you'll end up, if the goal is to turn them, you'll end up turning your upper body to try and help make that happen. So if you want the legs to do a lot of the turning effort, one, make them very light. Two, keep them very flat. Now that works in some situations, but like here, I'm not going to keep my skis flat because <laughs> then I'm going to be not in the right edge angle by the time I get to the right point. So the other one, other than turning in the air, is get forward. Because then the ski goes into that self-steering effect. Now it changes direction you'll, and you just feel it in your legs and feet and, and then stop it happening when you, know, where, when you want it to, like there. So, so like right here, very light on my feet, very light on my feet. When my edges engage, I get a little more forward. You can kind of maybe see it tell in the upper body, like there's this, like trying to drive forward. Now it's in the right position, engaged, off I go. So, uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, what's this one? Oh, this is, this is an uh, interesting uh, like self-testing I did. These are carve sensors. Um, and this comes to the question how much, what Richard asked, like how much fore and aft movement. When, when you press uh, on the, is it that one? There it goes. When you press on the cuff of the boot to get forward and you have pressure sensors under uh, your feet, what you'll see, and you can test this yourself if you have carve, you'll see the heel sensor light up. And the more you push on that cuff, the harder you push on that cuff, the more the heel gets heavier and less the ball, the foot lights up. Okay? And part of what's going on there, uh, when you really smash the front of the cuff instead of actually standing through the ball of the foot, is because you're trying to push into the cuff, your calf muscle switches off because that helps your body now just drive, because your calf muscle stops your, your ankle going forward, stops your shin going forward. So you try and push there, your, body, your brain goes right, we'll help that, we'll turn off the calf muscle. So now the, 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 uh, the calf muscle and the, and the muscles underneath the foot, uh, like the plantar fascia, they get looser, so you can just shove your shin forward. And so all that happens is the heel gets driven down and then the front of the foot is almost like separated or disengaged from the shin. And so you press really hard and the ball of the foot doesn't go down. Yes, you're leveraging forward on, on the boot and that's in the binding and that's going to like put pressure on the ski, but you're not going to feel it very much under the ball of your foot. So this is just me, but when I ski, I try and keep my foot engaged all the time. And I do press on the front of the boot, but a lot of the time there's still a lot of activation of the ball of my foot as well, so I can use my, the sole of my foot to, to feel it. When you, when you shove on the front of the boot, you almost turn off the sensors under your feet and, and how well you can feel. It's like a, a, too much of a gross movement. Uh, okay. Da -da -da. Anyone got any questions? If we maybe talk, say this section is about um, like mixing steering into pure carving by playing with fore and aft pressure. Okay, cool. So, yeah, use it to your advantage. Load front side of the binding creates uh, torsion and a friction difference. The friction difference is just like the, the tip of the ski, like having more friction, the tail is, has less, so then it, it, it rotates, you get a rotation. So use that to your advantage. It's pretty small as you saw when I do it to, to make a, a change. Just as you can get forward to stop or, so you, you can get forward to make a ski uh, like rotate in this direction, just like when I grab here, see there's a rotation. In the middle, if I push the load, like so that's where the load is of your body through the middle, it doesn't create a rotation, it moves sideways. I go like this, push through where the binding is, there's, there's, there's a pivot, a turn. You can go the other way. So say in a short turn, I'm coming around, forward, centered. Why would I go back a little bit? Well, if I want to stop the rotation, I could also put uh, the load back here to grip it more. 
now my body weight is doing this to the ski. So it's actually rotating it back in the other direction. If that goes over your head, don't worry. If, uh, if it makes sense, good. But yeah, playing with where the load is, you can create rotation this way, but you can also then put it back here to create a rotation the other way. I like, I definitely play with that a lot in, in moguls. Um, and it's kind of like uh, when a kayaker is going down the river and if you're in, in the kayak and you're paddling along and you want to turn that way, if you jam your oar back here, you create like a pivot point that everything will move around. Um, so kind of like a ski, you jam the back edge in, keep the load here, you can pivot the tips down the hill and then make a move forward uh, after that. But playing with fore and aft to help rotate the ski is, uh, is, is a really good skill and something fun to do. So I guess here, just some things to think about yourself. Uh, and yeah, like just ask yourself, like where do you press under your feet at the start of say a pure carb turn? Is it different if you're doing a basic short turn? Is it different uh, in uh, like more of a carb? So blended, not just pure carb, but not steered, like, like right in the middle. Uh, where do you press in the middle of the turn? Where do you press at the end of the turn? Like ask yourself these questions when you go out skiing next time and see if you get some information back from your feet and it might help you in like, okay, well, you know, I always find it very difficult. I don't turn my feet fast enough or my upper body rotates when I do that. Where am I pressing? What, what, what's going on at this point? Uh, because you've learned now how that pressure affects uh, a ski performing. This is just a good angle of uh, Ted Ligeti showing like kind of some fore and aft uh, exaggerated sort of movement. And so, you know, this is combinations of changing the pressure. You can pull your feet back and move your upper body forward. You could not move your feet and just move the upper body forward. You can do combinations of like everything in between, move the bottom, move the top, move both together. But that's just a good visual of seeing uh, someone at pretty high level doing like slalom turns and really moving, moving the ski around and which is changing the pressure under it to, um, yeah, make it turn. So uh, the tails of the skis, uh, I just put this in here, like the, the, the tip of the ski, really important at the start of the turn. It's gonna help you pull in, help you steer. But the tails of the ski, I, I mention this because I think it's often not talked about and uh, it's a really important one. Uh, a couple of things interesting here, like the tail in, in firm snow is where you get the greatest grip. It's, uh, it's usually, in, in a lot of skis, it's the stiffer part of the ski. If you put more weight over that point, that's pre pre it's gonna put more pressure there, that's gonna bite into the snow better. Also, usually what happens at the end of every turn that doesn't feel good is when the back of your ski washes out. Probably people felt that a lot today in the, in the really rough snow. So if that's what's happening, think of ways to anti that, stop that. And so, the tail is moving away from you, how do you keep it back under you and, and not doing that? So, um, yeah, really, really important thing. I, I should say too, when, as you start getting better at skiing, like, like Henrik Christophson and, and Marcel Herscher here, because you're going to, say in a shorter turn, need to go from one set of edges to the other quite quickly to try and again, like make the ski, you're gonna go faster if you can carve all the way around instead of skid. If you need to get across to be able to bend the ski and carve it, it's faster to move your center of mass more directly across. So these people are lower in the transition. They might look back, but right here at that bottom frame, they've already, they're done with the turn. So there's no pressure there. They're just getting from one side to the other. When your ski boots are on, they're very stiff. They don't allow your ankle to bend very much. And so you can't, you can't stay as forward as say I can uh, in a squat like this in, in ski boots. You can't do this because the ski boots keep you here. So in order to fit your feet back under you to cross over quicker, you have to be in this type of position right here, like both those guys are. So for your feet to fit under, 
or your body to be able to go over uninterrupted by the feet uh, in a 160-170 flex ski boot, you're often going to see this happen. And then uh, second, talking about the, uh, the pressure and better penetration, you'll see like right here, ski's sort of skidded, skidded, he wants to stop it. Can you see the tail of the ski is like really bent? A lot of pressure there. Uh, for a very short moment, he's very strong. He's also going to go very quickly across uh, from this point to the other side. But I guess um, if there's one thing I've learned, it's don't be afraid of using the tail of the ski uh, as long as afterwards you get back and, and, and use, use the tip again. But the tail of the ski will really help you grip and uh, also using it will help you fit and make a lower transition as, as you start getting better and make more performance turns. So on that, I just see so many people out there that think you've got to stay forward all the time, particularly at the end of the turn. And so all these people, this is coming through the, the end of the turn. I'm the person in the orange at the bottom. If, if you notice, like their body is really ahead of that outside foot the, the, the whole time. At the end of the turn, they never get a platform because if the load is forward, it keeps self-steering. So the tail is continually washing away so your heel never has something firm to stand on. So you never really get to finish solidly. From that point, hard to go into the start of the next turn. Um, so and I make a point at the bottom there about, um, you know, when I'm using more of the middle and the tail of the ski, I still have a very flexed, flexed ankle. Uh, the difference between loading the tail of the ski and back seat, I would say, is someone in the back seat, their ankle's not engaged and the ankle's not flexed. Whereas someone back seat, the ankle disengages, uh, and so that's why they're back seat. So like these guys, you can see you can see like the ankle looks very engaged as uh, as they're going that far back. Stiff boots also really help. Um, we won't do that one. So summary. Understand the two ways uh, a ski turns either by tipping it more, putting pressure on it, bending it. The more you tip it, the more you can bend it. So that's one way you can turn the ski more if you need to turn it. Or like skid steering. And so remember, to make it easier to do that, either you've got to have, you know, you not be on the ground or less be on the ground, have a flat ski, or utilize fore and aft and being forward to create a pivot point and, and what Yuri figured out, like what makes a ski skid, don't have the pressure in the center. So yeah, so, th so on, the, on the foot pressuring stuff, like be more sensitive or pay attention to your feet. They'll tell you everything what's going on. On that too, if you can't feel your feet that well, then like that's why boot fitting is really important and what you put under your feet is really important. Uh, the ski fits the snow like at one point of loading. So like each individual ski you've got, there's like a sweet spot. So just learn to feel that when you stand there, like where is the pressure, where is your posture, what does it feel like? Learn to know that so when if you get into a skid or, or whatever and it's unexpected, you're searching to find that point again, that one spot that it fits. And um, yeah, your feet are not so big. So fore and aft is pretty subtle. Uh, especially if your feet are, uh, if you can feel what's going on in your feet, yeah, because yeah, that uh, that that load difference, as soon as it's changed, it that that ski starts self steering itself. So, yeah. Uh, final plug for myself: I have an online learning resource, hundreds of videos, information packed, this sort of stuff. You can improve all year round. Uh, get more info from me. If, you, if you're interested, if you haven't ever subscribed before, I've got a code at the moment for all uh, New Zealand people. The code is NZ2022, capitals, you get 40% off. Um, yeah. Any questions? Can't believe this. I know I can see some people like tired, end of a day. It was a hard, hard day of skiing. Any, anyone? Like, uh, who found that interesting and wants to go, like, play more with the fore and aft? Yeah? Yeah, you do? Yeah. Yeah. I know with my guys today, I, um, 
I was doing, uh, we, were, we were playing with the front of the ski more. So really like trying to get the, the tip of the ski to engage and, and not turn the ski at all, only through forward pressure, that's how it would, how it would steer. And that was a really interesting thing to do and, and on the ice a lot of people found it they actually had a whole lot more control and the ski self steered itself through all the crud instead of trying to control it more uh, which was which was really different um, and a few people had done sort of training in, in systems where it's more about staying centered and those people had really big aha moments being like way more forward and you know their comfort level on that really rubbish hard snow with sugary stuff on top uh, went up like a lot so I found that interesting um, yeah and and uh, yeah we did a lot of practice of of just feeling it and getting them to pay attention to what what they were doing and how that was different to what they would normally do before. Um, just to go back to your pressure in the front and the back, you use the kayaker. Example, yep. For example, like in, in moguls, you may initiate the turn using the front, but if you complete the turn, let the skis go past, you can then turn off the back. Yep. Was that, is that an example of what That's an example. the skis? Yep. Yep, like today in the afternoon we were doing some, some pivot slips in the moguls and so think of this example, if, um, if this is the skier pivot slipping down, if you pivot slip into the mogul right in the centre, it stops. If you pivot slip down with the tip hitting it, the tail is going to wash out this way. If you pivot slip down and then hit, hit the tails at the end, now your load pushes past, gets past the bump, the tail grips, turning with like pinballing down, <laughs> just getting knocked down the mountain. It's very, it's really uh, like really efficient. Uh, Wayne Wong is really good at doing that. People know who he is, old school bumper. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, using the tail is, it's fun. Yep. Anyone else got any questions? No? Fantastic. Let that sink in, have a sleep and hopefully that helps you. Uh, f with your, your training and, and playing around with it more and yeah, utilizing the equipment better.